common wisdom in our parts is when you get to springtime, it's the time when you reverse your brood boxes. Common wisdom. So you're going to take the top box because the bees started in the bottom in, in the late fall. They got through winter and then as it starts to get warmer, they're moving up into the honey dome and they're in the top box. Bees move up, right? That's a wives tale where it is and you, you believe what you want to believe, right? But the typical instruction set for us is take that top box and put it in the bottom, put the empty over top and they'll work their way up and fill the box out. Okay, not, not a bad idea except that and I, I'm going to talk about Walt Wright and we'll provide a link to this and you could go read some of this information. Walt Wright's a guy that did a lot of work on how bees operate in the spring and especially about swarm prevention. And as Bob said and as Charlie pointed out, this is the time, believe it or not, it's zero degrees outside overnight tonight here in New Jersey, but the bees are thinking spring. As soon as they get those warm days, even sooner than you think, they're going to start their operation to get to the nectar flow. Okay? So we say reverse the brood. That's what we talk about. But there's a difficulty with this because the Merrick guide that we follow for the Mid-Atlantic says 60 to 80 pounds. And your box has a honey dome over top of that top box. And when you reverse it, if you look at the color coding on the slide, orange is brood, yellow is honey. You took this box and you put it here. Now look what we got here. The brood, there's a middle line right here. So some of that brood, and this is a 60 to 80, right? I'm, I'm going to say this is not an evil method, and I'll cover it later and I'll come back, so just hold on to that. But do realize what we've done here. We've taken this top box that has a honey dome, and we've put it in the bottom, and we've isolated the brood underneath it. We've taken some of the brood that was in the bottom box still, because they had 60 to 80, they may not have moved up, and we stuck it up here in the top all by itself. Okay, we split the brood. And brood, generally, the queen is not going to go through a honey dome to lay up here. So Walt's findings are, what happens? Queen shuts down, retards the growth of the hive in the spring. Exactly what we don't want to achieve. So he's saying in certain areas, this is not right. And that honey dome is almost like a queen excluder. That's not good, okay? So what do we do? What's the right way to do this? When two high bodies are properly filled in the fall, the bees will winter in the lower, as we said. They'll start to move up, and then they'll fill the brood out, okay? They're gonna start in the lower, they're gonna come out to the dome, and bees move up, but quite frankly, if there's nothing to go up to, they'll move down and fill the box. You don't necessarily have to reverse. They'll make bees where there's space. So all stores are consumed in the upper. The brood nest is expanded into the bottom of the upper while maintaining brood in the lower hive body. So no, no reason to change in this capacity. So here's what happens. The bees, the hive, the, hive, the colony, wants to propagate. This is how the species survives. They want to swarm. What do they have to have to swarm? What do they have to have? A new queen and lots of bees in basic principle. So that queen is going to start laying with whatever resources she has and she's going to fill that whole box out. Okay? With bees. Crowd it up. Then they're going to hit the nectar flow and they're going to fill it with nectar. And that backfill of nectar is going to make it so the queen can't lay. And the queen is going to slim down and bang, you have a swarm. Okay? This is how a hive operates with no relief above them. Normal course of action. So if, if you have this situation where you have honey on the top 
and you have the brood here and you leave it be, this is what happens. They fill with brood and then eventually they load it up with nectar and eventually they swarm. That's what happens. So what's happening here? Late winter through to March 15th, stage three. Here's the diagram of it, okay? They're in the top, late winter. They grow. They grow. What happened here? All of a sudden there's no more brood. They left. They swarmed. Natural progression of things, okay? This is what you as a beekeeper do or don't want. If you want to cast swarms off, you have no difficulty with that. There you go. They took care of it for you. But if you want to keep the bees and you want to build a massive workforce to bring honey or you want to do splits or you have other objectives, you need to do something about this. So let's see what's next. I have this in stage three. What was stage four? Swarm. So what do I do to relieve? I checkerboard. What I'm going to do is I am going to do two objectives here. One is I'm going to make more room inside the brood cavity. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give a pathway through that honey dome so that the queen can pass up and the bees can pass up through. So what have I done here? Selectively, I've taken a handful of frames and I've made an adjustment. I've added a deep box. Why does it have to be a deep box? Because the frames you're pulling up are coming out of deeps. It's a practical matter, okay? I've taken a frame out of the bottom. I've taken a couple frames out of the top. In this example, I pulled four. And I dispersed them across. Now, this might seem a little strange, whether it works or not. The heat is coming from the bottom and it's coming up you have the same amount of nurse bees, they were already over here covering the brood, so they should be able to handle whatever you have. And the other thing that you've created is if you created space in the brood chamber for the queen to work, there's not all the congestion, and you've increased the place where the honey dome can be and where the brood can be. And I'll get to that in a second, just stay with me. Everybody following this? So this is a technique called checkerboarding, and it relieves pressure. What bees don't like, they don't like open brood next to a foundation. They'll build that frame out right away, okay? And you have to have bees that are a certain age. So you wanna do this at a point where bees are emerging because the bees that are eight, eight to 13 days old or something, they're the ones that make wax. When they get older, they don't have the capacity to do that. The other thing that they need is they need a big workforce. They need heat to create wax. They gotta get really hot to do this, right? So the timing of this is when you get to the stage where the thing is loaded, and then you go to your checkerboard situation. Okay, here we go. We've checkerboarded. Stage four. Now we carry the next logical progression. What's the queen do? She does what she's supposed to do. She lays more eggs. Away they go. And they filled the honey dome up on the top. So it doesn't show up well from this projector. So I'll describe it verbally. These frames are brown. They're brown. They're meaning they're brand new. There's nothing in them. These frames are gold. And you can kind of see the coloring. If you look between these two, maybe you can see the difference. Didn't show up well here, sorry. We'll change the slides and we'll make them better. But what's happening here is the queen has filled all this and you have honey up here, stage five. The nectar flow is on, you've relieved the pressure, the brood is built. You're in a good, good place here. But you need to do something, so what do you do? You put another box on the top. That's a honey super. Deep, deep, deep honey super, a medium. Good question. What is that? That's a medium on top. Okay. You could put a shallow. Yeah. Your choice. But that's a medium in the picture. What do they do? They fill it with honey. So this is what you do all the time. You may not have gotten the third box on, but you certainly are putting honey supers on. Standard fare. 
But now you got this. You got three deeps, and you got a medium, and, and you're full. Now what? Now what do you do? Couple options. Here's your box that you started with. You've progressed. You put a frame on. They filled it with honey. You got this. I'll give you two options. First one is you checkerboard the honey. Pull each other, every other frame of honey up into the box. And guess what you created? Now hopefully you have some honey that's open. Open face, meaning not capped. And what you do is you're enticing the bees to fill those. They do not like empty frames inside of honey frames. The other thing you could do, think of a wary hive example, is you under super. So you take that box and you put it on top of another one and you put a blank underneath. Either one works. Personal preference for you as beekeeper how you want to do this. Therefore preventing swarming. Okay, I got some questions, so go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think you said the empty frames are just foundation. They're found, it, look, it, when you're doing honey, so the, the question is they're just foundation. Go ahead and finish. You when you're checkerboarding, so yes. If you have frames that have wax up, that won't work? That will work, yes. In, in fact, so let me repeat it for the camera. The question is if you have, uh, foundation frames or filled frames, could you use both? The answer is actually, whenever you're doing honey, it's in your best interest to try and have comb. Because they'll fill the honey faster for you. If they have to build comb and they're not in a comb state, they won't build it for you and you'll, you'll sit here. So, comb is the most valuable resource you have as a beekeeper. Let me say that again. The most valuable resource. It takes a lot of honey and pollen for them to create comb, treasure it. Now the old antique stuff, brown, pesticide laden, rotate that out. Three a year out of the brood. And it isn't a bad idea to get rid of some of this honey stuff that's old. But when you have fresh, clean, nice comb, it is gold. It's, it's your most important asset. So to your point, Pierre, yeah, use full, full frames if you have them. But if you don't, and you're in the nectar flow, and you have wax making bees, they will build that out like nobody's business. So, I had a question over here? You, say, well, you, you mentioned the name Walt. Who, who Walt, Walt Wright. Right, W-R-I-T-H-T. Yep. And you said under supering, is that bottom supering? Under supering means you take the honey box that you had, and you lift it up, and you put a clean one underneath and you put that honey on top. What you don't want to do is, let me point this out, that's a great point. You don't want to do the opposite of this. You don't want to put the honey here and put an empty box on top. They generally will not pass through a fully, unless they're really, unless they mean business, they're not going to pass through a full honey super to get up and build, okay? They might, they'll be very laissez-faire about it, but you're better off to put the honey on the top and put the empty underneath it and let them do that or do the checkerboard method. Or both, which it, again, personal preference. Roger? If you checkerboard the foundation between partially filled honey frames, they will continue to build the honey yep. frames out and ignore that one in between. And you might have a honey frame twice Yeah, so the comment is, when you put an empty foundation next to a honey frame that's not capped, they may opt to build it wider. Wider is not better in this case, right? It, it's not terrible because you still could take that frame out, uncap it, and spin it, but now you got this festering frame that's double wide what it's supposed to be. Yeah, you're using 10 frames, right? You're, you're banking on the fact that they're gonna start with the foundation, but sometimes they will make wonky comb. It depends on your hive and what they do. It, it is a good, valid point to think about it. And if they're doing that, then you take a look, you start seeing them not, not building the foundation, but filling the other ones, then make an adjustment. Put it next to another foundation where they're touching and they'll come in and eat the, the wax back so that they have a pathway between them. And you could just put all the frames that they're building out together and do it that way. There's a lot of beekeepers that will tell you when you put your honey frames in, spread them apart a little bit further 
so that they build past the face of the frame. So when you put it down and you go to shave that off, it's a lot easier to get your knife in. There is one difficulty with this, so be careful with it. Think about the way the hives are situated. There's a lane between every one of those all the way up and the airflow goes through until it hits the bottom of that honey frame which is off kilter. You're changing the way the air flows through. So if you're changing the spacing, make sure you're doing it at the top and make sure you provide ventilation so that if the moisture, for example, is coming up through that hive, that there's a means for that moisture to get out and it's not being trapped underneath the super, okay? The bees fix a lot of these problems, by the way. So even if you did it a little bit wrong, they could probably compensate. You have a question? Yeah. Um, the honey barrier will keep the queen from going up. Yes. So that means you don't use queen excluders. I don't use queen excluders. The only time I, so the question is the honey barrier keeps the queen from going up. I'm going to cover another way to do that which in fact that's that's it but I'll wait till I get to that but yeah the honey barrier queens generally will not cross honey to go lay brood up on the top now there is something to the concept of a queen excluder for people who produce honey for sale I'm gonna be a little crude when you have brood the brood defecates in a cell if the bees pull that brood out at some point let's say they got up into one of these supers and they had some brood for a period of time, but then they switched back over and made that honey. They're gonna clean that cell out scrupulous. You'll never know the difference, you personally, but some people kind of get a little queasy about there was brood in there and there was stuff going on in there and now there's honey in there and I'm gonna eat that, okay? So in that case, you'll see, and I've talked to commercial people who put a queen excluder in and they assure that there's never any brood. One of the difficulties with a clean excluder I've heard from researchers is every time a bee passes through that, all, all bees are not created equal. Some of them are a little bigger than others, and if they're a little bit bigger of a bee, the girl will damage your wings, damage your body, and it will take away the lifespan of the bee. So some people say never use a queen excluder. Again, 10 stories from 10 different beekeepers are all different about this stuff. Here's your other option. You're crowded. You have to make relief out of your two stack. What do you do? Our previous meeting, we talked about making nukes. This is how you get started. Instead of putting the third box on top and checkerboarding the brood through that and building a three deep, pull them out and put them in a nuke or start a new hive with them. This is sustainable beekeeping. So one of the things we talked about is how do you get your nukes started? Springtime is the best time, and this is how you do it. Okay? Gotta have your equipment ready. This is happening in March. Remember March 15th, ballpark our area. Kenny? Yes? If you're doing that, don't you have So the question is, if you're doing this manipulation, do you have to take them somewhere else? Actually, what's happening, there's different ways to do this. If you, take, if you take these bees out of this box and you put them in this box, you're gonna get a mix. You're gonna get nurse bees, you're gonna get forager bees. The nurse bees are not loyal to the queen. They are loyal to the brood. They will not leave it. So the nurse bees will stay in the hive. The foragers, will come right out the entrance and go back home because that's home for them. What you want to do when you take a couple frames out, and we did, we did a split thing and we can cover this again when we get to split timing. You're going to take that out. You're going to take a couple frames of uh, brood frames out of your hive and you're going to shake those nurse bees inside there and they'll make more nurse bees in the mother hive where you got them from. Obviously, when you pull these frames out, what don't you want to take? Queen. The queen. <laughs> Maybe you do. But when you pull these frames, and I, I didn't want to go into a splits thing, I just wanted to make a principle, but when you pull these out, they have to have two-day or younger larvae so that these will raise a queen. 
they'll, they'll do royal jelly and they'll make queen cells and they'll do all that, okay? Even with the split, super. Because at any given point, what you pulled out of the hive will get replaced with what's growing. This is, this is bee season, springtime. They're making bees like factory, right? So even if you pull a couple frames out to give relief, in short order, they'll build, that frame, they'll build you out and swarm. So give them something. Preferably drawn comb. Again, comb is gold. Okay, I made a new name. Tim watches this video, he'll probably laugh or he'll write me a note. Tim Tower Hive Ives. If you've ever seen the video of this guy, he's standing on a stepladder with 18 boxes doing his thing. So this, is, this comes back to the conversation about the queen excluder. His, his technique is that he comes out in March, early, we watched a video, Bob and I, the other day of him on March 15th. He's in Indiana, just about the same latitude we are. He puts an empty on, and then he puts drawn comb above that. And his comment is that the queen will never pass across a new hive with just foundation. She'll always stay there. And then the other thing I want you to understand, right? If I go back to this picture, pretend these are not on here, but I had a picture like this. I had this big brood frame and I had honey on the top and I said, well, put a honey box on top. Well, wait, isn't that the same condition we had a little bit earlier where they were confined and, and they are going to swarm? Fact of the matter is a brood chamber generally only gets two and a half deeps. They don't get much bigger than that. Now, as soon as I say that, somebody will probably write me a note proving me otherwise. But that's the general consensus. And by the time they get to two and a half, the forage season is over and they start to contract. So if you get two and a half, if you get a three deep system, most people will tell you that three deeps, one, two, three, are big enough to be the brood chamber and you never go in there. No need to go in. Just manipulate the honey on the top and leave them be. Okay? Let me stop. Any questions so far about what I did? I can go back. Question. With Tim's method, he essentially adds several honey supers at once. Yep. With the previous method you were talking about, you were talking about doing it one at a time. Is there a difference or a reason why? What what Tim is doing what Tim is doing and, and what Tim is doing is something that not everybody's overly clear on, so let me be that way. I don't want to pretend I know what Tim is doing. Um, but, but the things that I've seen is he's adding a blank and then he's putting multiples on right, at, right prior to the nectar flow. So there are certain situations, I'll make one up, where you have black locusts blooming. When you have black locusts, they can fill a box a day. So putting one box over top of an empty is not going to do it for you. You're going to put multiples on. It all depends on what you have in your forage area. You should know after a couple seasons, are they going to load boxes or are they going to load a box and act accordingly? How much do you want to be out there too? I mean, certain beekeepers are out, they have five yards and they don't want to keep going to them. So they put multiple supers on and then they come back later. So what people do is different depending on their situation. My suggestion is if you have, one other thing is how many of you have five supers sitting around ready to go with comb to put on every one of your hives. Tim always says, you know, one of his biggest challenges is having enough equipment, right? So you have to do what's right for you. I, I can't give you guidance on that. Um, is there, I'm going to go back to something uh, Charlie said, which was really important. How warm is it inside the cluster? 95, 98, right? How warm is it outside when you start going in your boxes? 50, 65, four minutes. That's all you get. Open a box, do what you're gonna do, close a box. You open that box on a 70 degree day, you're in short sleeves. That box is 95 in the middle. Go right now and open the door while it's zero and it's 50 in here, or 60 or 70. You're gonna feel that blast, that's what they feel. 
So whatever you're doing, supering this time of year, March 15th, you're going to look for a warm day, but even if it's 65 degrees, when you crack those hives open, you're letting your heat out. You're wrecking the ecosystem inside the hive, the moisture control that they have, the heat, the ambient temperature, all of that stuff that they manage. So figure out your game plan, go do it, and put it back together. They have everything sealed up from fall. Now they're on the cluster. You go in and break all the seals. <coughs> then you put it back together. They're on a cluster, they can't go repair that. Maybe they'll get a warm day and they'll come out, but they're not flying out and getting resin from some broken tree because there isn't any, right? So just kind of keep all this stuff in mind. Let them be is a really good concept. Thank you, Jason Bruns. Varroa. So this is another spring concept I wanted to give you, because we always talk about Varroa in the summertime which is a great time to talk about Varroa. New beekeepers, started your hive, no Varroa in the beginning, overwintered, Varroa are in the cluster, might even be a drone kicking around in there. But when you start, you're starting with a low threshold. I'll make up a number, five Varroa, total in the hive, five. Those five Varroa, by the end of summer, based on a 12-fold increase is what they say, will repeat and repeat and repeat, and at some point they're going to have this size workforce from five Varroa. When we talk about Varroa at the end of the season, August, State Apiary always tells you, treat your Varroa in August. Okay? Why? Why is that? Because you're growing brood, grow, 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 grow. Varroa is growing with them. Varroa is odd, it's an odd thing. It grows when the bees prosper. That's unusual for a parasitic type thing. Grow, 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 grow. You get to August, dirt, 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 they go down. But what happens to the Varroa? They're still there, they, they wanna go. The other thing that happens, queen shuts down and they kick the boys out. No more drones. Where do the Varroa live? with the drones. Where do the Varroa live? In the brood. What just happened in August? The drones, they're starting to go away in preparation for being ejected. The brood is ramping down. There's not rampant forage from the spring. Where do all those Varroa come? They come out of the hive and they get on the bees. And then all of a sudden, in September, your whole workforce is gone. This was your winter bees. They were gonna start your winter bees. So coming back, when you have hives that are relatively new and they started with five Varroa, how they ramp to the point where that August happens is completely different from hive that's a couple generations old and starts with 20 Varroa. Their growth curve, 12 fold, remember, they're on a different growth curve, they're big. By the end of summer, they got a huge batch of Varroa waiting to get your bees. So one of the thoughts, new thoughts, is do you consider treatments in spring? Do you consider that? Do you knock that threshold in the beginning so that they don't have that huge ramp when you get to August and September? And then you hit them again in August, September. I'm gonna give you the Randy Oliver scientific beekeeping politically correct answer is you monitor your beets all the time, your mites all the time, and when you're at your threshold, you treat. But when he was here at this school speaking to us, what he does is he monitors all year long. And he gives a little dose here and a little dose there and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. He's treating all year long. Now again, goes back to the comment I made to you. He's a commercial beekeeper. His objective is take bees to almonds or whatever they do. They're not a hobbyist beekeeper like most of us, right? So again, your treatment program has to be to what you have going on in your yard in New Jersey. But I want you just, I want to plant that seed about the Varroa thing, okay? One more slide. Remember this? This is how we started the night. I said the one on the left is evil, right? Because you have the honey dome. This one, if you didn't have 60, 80 pounds, but your bee survived, and they're literally up against the roof. 
and you're feeding them emergency sugar candy and you've gotten them by, they're one box of bees. You want to reverse them? This is not evil because here they have brood, they have a minimal amount of honey and they have space and bees go up. So you could do that. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to nuke the concept of the reversal because there is a place for it. But when you have the honey dome, whoops, going the wrong way. When you have the honey dome like this, do use your, you know, use your brain on that one. So spring management, questions? Can you, uh, you use your checkerboarding technique, do you use it? Do I, I did checkerboard my hives last year, yes. Okay. I use nine in mine. You use a nine yeah. system? Well, ten, ten or nine is the same concept, right? Yeah. Okay. And so they take and they really do a good job of filling out your wax for you. You came to my house last year, I think. I, I know a couple of people were there. Yeah. I had one hive in the middle that was this high. Yeah. That was the one I checkerboarded. Wow. So they filled it out. They filled it out, loaded it all the way to the top. Wow. My strongest hive. The question was, did I checkerboard the honey? Yes, I did. I did. I did the technique. First, I checkerboarded the, let me think about what I really did. I checkerboarded the brood early. I put a honey box on. They loaded that honey box up. When I had nine frames, when I had seven of them full, I checkerboarded that and they drew it all through. I put another one on top. I checkerboarded that, but put a lot of honey up in the top and left the, the two ones underneath. So follow me. I started with one super, they filled it. I checkerboarded with the second super, they filled it. I took honey out of those two supers and I put it all up top so it was full and I put a new box underneath and put some frames in there to work, they filled it. Three of them by the end of the season. Now we had a really funny spring last year they did a lot of work in short order. And why? Because I had supers with comb ready to go. It's the only reason why it worked. We had a spring last year where the honey flow came a little bit early, nectar flow came a little bit early. Then we had all that rain in June. And then July was 95 degrees. And after July, it went gone, right? But in the time frame, because I was prepared and checkerboard and had a big, huge workforce, loaded those, th they, they filled that thing out right to the top. It was brimming all the way through. Yeah? Last year, when did you check a board? I went out, I wasn't in as early as uh, March 15th. I think I went out April 1st and checkerboarded. Now, I, I had a unique situation. I was trying to experiment where I didn't feed my hives. So my hives were a little light. So they were a little behind everybody else. Everybody else was calling me in March going, can you believe what's going on with the bees? And I'm like, <laughs> I was in a little different situation, but they caught up. Yeah. Can you talk about chilling the brood? Chilling the brood, yeah. So the question is about chilling the brood. Look, every time you take that frame out and you hold it up and you're in 70 degrees, that's a 25 degree shock. When you're doing some of those manipulations, if you're bringing them to the top of the hive, heat rises to the top. So as we did the checkerboard and brought it up, all the heat from the bees in the bottom will come up. They'll also, the nurse bees will always cover that brood. Um, there's different schools of thought about whether you're moving open frames up or closed ones. If you use a closed ones up, you're getting them up out of the way and then they're hatching out. You really, you really don't want a ton of brood in that third box. You really want to contain them in two and then have some of them in the third box. Now look, bees are of mind. There's, there's a lot of things that drive this. For example, here's my hive. There's the sun. They're over on this side of the hive. They're not necessarily in the middle. And your sun may go this way or it may go across this way. You, don't, you know what your situation is. They literally will move with the sun sometimes, depending on the way the heat hives. Right now, when it's super, super cold, the discussion is they cluster in the middle center. They stay away from the sides, right? 
But when the weather breaks and it's warm, they, they do literally move inside the hive is what they show. But when you move the bees, you want to bring those frames up with the brood and you want to have them, uh, you want the nurse bees to take care of them. So, and they will. Question? Okay. Okay. So let's see a show of hands. How many still have all your hives in good shape? Three quarters of the audience, that's good. How many have lost one hive or two? One or two, only one. How many have lost all your hives so far? Nobody, that's good news. Has anybody have no hives? Raise your hand. Got two, good, okay. We'll get you guys started. All right. Um, anything, Bob, to add to this? Okay. Thanks, everybody. These these videos will be up on our YouTube channel, so you can come back and watch them. If you think of questions on your ride home, feel free to send us a note, and we'll help you out. I have a question in the back. This one. Yeah, going into the, to the following year, presumptively the, the uh, two top boxes would have some room, maybe take the bottom box and put it up on top. So your question is, and, and actually that's good, I forgot to say this. If you get to the third one and now you have three deeps, right? right. What do you do the following year with that? There's a, there's a new swing in beekeeping that even though bees in New Jersey will overwinter with two boxes, you're far better to have three. And this is not New Jersey, it's actually Tim the Tower Hive guy, he's the one that's kind of popularized this in his Bee Journal articles and other people are talking about it. The, the premise to your question is, if you can get to a three hive configuration, the number of bees you have in there coming out of winter, they, they will do whatever work you want. They're gonna heat the hive better, they're going to take care of business better in the spring. They're just going to explode when they go. So you hear a lot of people in the New Jersey thing hearing this vibe. And I, I know a number of beekeepers right now, they've switched last fall to a three deep configuration and they're coming through the winter. And so far what I'm hearing is it's good. They got it right. Three is actually better. So in the second year, would you take the bottom deep and put it on the top? Because they've moved up and they're empty? Ideally, what's going to happen is they're not going to, they'll stay down there. You're going to have enough forage in the fall that they're going to load that third box with honey. Now look, we've talked about tower hives and we've talked about all these honey supers, which are great. But you're going to take the honey supers off, but you have to leave them 60 to 80 pounds, right? Where's that 60 to 80 pounds going to be? If they're occupying two, two and a half, it's going to be here in the top of this box. So they should still be down in that bottom box. They should be using it. Another thing to think about is, from an efficiency standpoint, they're going to be where the entrance is. They're not going to move the whole hive up in the cavity, at, at least this is my thought. When the entrance is down there, it's inefficient. So, they make their own heat in the winter. Inside the hive, they have this cluster like the earth. I've described this in the past. And they're shoulder to shoulder on the outside mantle of the cluster, preventing the heat from coming out. The, the, in, the inside temperature is a couple degrees above ambient, generally, when it's really cold. They're not shoved up, up under the lid. They might be underneath the honey dome. They're living inside the cells. They generate heat by doing exercise, like Charlie said. They don't literally flap their wings. They have three muscles, a muscle here, a muscle in the chest, and a muscle between. They can relax that muscle or tension that muscle. If they tension it, the wing flaps. If they don't, they're just doing B aerobics. And that's how they generate heat. So they generate heat and they give it off to the air, or they get next to each other and transfer it. Or they get inside the cell and transfer it to the larva on the other side. 
but they're generating the heat inside and they don't necessarily have to go up because the outside bees are keeping that heat from escaping. So some of the things that Charlie talked about, this thing's rock hard. The, the moisture is going to come up with the heat and it's going to soften the bottom of this. The heat is also going to soften this. If you have the honey dome over top, let me find a frame that... This picture right here. What happens to this honey right over the chamber? It gets warm. They actually, they actually can consume that. It's not a honeysickle in the winter time because it's warm, it's over the brood. The heat that they do give off is going to make it possibly... So in the beginning what they say is that the bee is in the center cluster and they typically move right and left to the pollen and the honey that they need. And it's only after winter when it starts to break that they tend to extend. They get a warm day, they might go up and they might pull it down. But they're not, they're not all over the place inside the, the cluster. They're kind of set where they're going to be until the weather breaks. That's my understanding. And again, ask 10 people and you get 10 different answers. So, Did I answer your question? I think they're going to be down. And that's what Walt is saying. You know, going back to what we started with, they will fill down the lower brood chamber and shut the queen off. They want to swarm. Stores are consumed in the upper. The brood nest is expanded to the bottom of the upper while maintaining the brood in the lower hive body. So they're going to stay there, basically. The other thing is, there's other things at play here. I mean, we're just talking about some mechanics, but you have pheromone in that. You have pheromone in the comb from the bees emerging. They generally stay where that is. They're not going to go up, you know, to some place where there is no pheromone. That's, that's the place where the brood cluster belongs. And that's why when you go in and start manipulating and moving brood over here and whatever, you're really, really kind of messing things up. Let them be, leave them be. There's a guy named Oscar Perone. His, his thing was, I think he's retired now, he built this box in Brazil or wherever he was, somewhere in South America. And he ran sticks, Argentina, and he put the bees in and he left them there. Now you got to have movable comb in New Jersey, but his point was that's for the bees. And then he put honey supers on top, and he took that when he needed it. But that's for the bees. We should kind of have the same concept. So, any other questions? Thank you.